I'm sort of tempted to reach for a cliche, the world is holding its breath. Um, I doubt that that's true, but there are a lot of people very interested and a little nervous as to how Israel might respond to the Iranian missile attack on Israeli territory. It is the first time since the Iranian revolution in 1979 that Iran has directly attacked Israeli targets. That attack didn't have much in the way of an impact, certainly not physically, but uh, in terms of diplomatically and strategically and in terms of sort of peace prospects for the region, it's made them seem even further away. The Israeli cabinet, war cabinet, has apparently already met three times and is uh, about to meet or is meeting for a fourth time to decide on what their response should be. Uh, even uh, their allies, who were very critical of what the Iranians did, are urging caution. And Benjamin Netanyahu has just told um, the UK Foreign Minister David Cameron, who is in Israel, that they don't need allies' advice. They are quite capable of deciding on their response by themselves. Thank you very much. We're joined now via Zoom by Dr. Hisham Helia, who is a senior associate fellow at the International Security Studies Royal United Services Institute for Defense and Security Studies. Uh, Dr. Hisham, good afternoon. Hello, John. I mean, how, again, you know, you're a journalist, so you reach for cliche, sort of how close to midnight on this issue are we, do you think? I'm not sure what we mean by midnight, to be honest with you, John. But um, uh, first, it's in, in this in, in the sense of a kind of almost all out regional conflagration. I'm happy to say that uh, I don't think that it's quite there. Um, and first, you know, I'm very happy to be on your program. And it's always a pleasure to be in touch with Cape Tonian audiences. Um, I think that we don't stand at a precipice as much as um, we're at a point where we could set into motion a sequence of events that could lead to a very bad uh, and highly violent war. But I think that there are several steps that would have to happen before that. So it would be best if the Israelis would respond in a way that didn't take us closer to that eventuality. Um, but having said that, for the past six months, there have been many voices calling for de-escalation measures, and the Israelis have ignored them and continue to escalate. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful that they will, at least in this instance, be a little bit more wary, um, considering uh, the uh, quite loud proclamations from different allies that, you know, you, you can't count on us to help you in this offensive. I do say I'm cautiously optimistic because I think the Israelis uh, probably estimate that while the United States would not jump in immediately, that they probably would jump in eventually. So I'm, I'm hoping they don't take that step. So what they, what the Israelis, I'm, I'm no expert on what the Israelis might be thinking, but I suspect, having read quite a lot about it in the last few days, that the Israelis will want to say, you can't attack us without us reacting, but they would want to to tread a very windy tightrope in not reacting in such a way that it almost guarantees further ex escalation. And one wonders how possible that is. So here's the thing about, you know, calibrating these responses. Um, so the first uh, the first step in this was the Israeli attack on the Iranian consulate in Damascus. Um, and I think there was a huge miscalculation. Um, I think that, unfortunately, in the environment of impunity that the Israelis feel they are in gave them the impression that, yeah, we can strike a consulate, a diplomatic consulate, um, even if it's of a state like Iran. I mean, I'm on the record as being highly critical of Iran in many ways, especially um, for assisting the Bashar al-Assad regime in Syria, uh, which I think is a grotesque regime. Um, but it's still a diplomatic 
entity and striking a consulate um, is, you know, fundamentally against, you know, the basic rules of how international diplomacy is supposed to work. Um, so I think the Israelis really miscalculated there where they thought they could do that and there wouldn't be a response. The calibration of the retaliation from the Isra from the Iranians, I think, uh, was over the top. I think that the Iranians reasoned that they did have to respond because if they didn't, then it would simply invite more flagrant violations of their territory. Keeping in mind that the, the consulate is Iranian territory, just like an embassy is and so on. Um, uh, but what they did was lob several hundred projectiles, missiles and ballistic uh, drones and ballistic missiles, which I think was, you know, far too much. Um, the question now becomes, how will the Israelis calibrate? And I think really the Israelis, unfortunately, will will not prioritize what you've just put in, uh, what you've just said quite eloquently. While the other, they'll prioritize two things. Netanyahu will prioritize how this will play out domestically. Um, and he's got a very, uh, a very unpopular position right now within the Israeli public who really want new elections and really don't like Netanyahu as a person, even though they support his bombardment of Gaza. Um, the second will be how much support and how quickly he's going to get that support from the United States um, following any reprisal, because there there is a sweet spot. OK, there is a type of response that the Israelis could do and there wouldn't be a response from the Iranians on Israeli territory. What might the that be? Is, uh, they could probably go after a bunch of uh, Iranian linked or aligned groups, but not in Iran itself on Iranian territory, but go after, you know, a lot of them all at once so that it was, quote unquote, just as good. Right. Um, but I'm not convinced that that's what they're going to do. I think that that would be a way for the Iranians to say, OK, we won't strike you directly because you didn't strike us back directly. Um, we've already done the direct part, right? The direct part from the, Isra from the Israeli point of view was or from the Israeli stance was the attack on the consulate because that's Iranian territory. The Iranians have responded with an attack on Israeli territory. Now they go back to tit for tat and a proxy kind of way. Uh, but again, I'm not sure that this is what the Israelis will do. That Iran doesn't seem particularly keen on going further than this. I mean, the fact that they gave yeah. uh, the U.S. the notice that they did, which allowed the U.S. to to help the Israelis man the defense system, which meant that the attack didn't have cost in terms of lives and infrastructure yeah, damage, um, suggests that they they would like this to be the end of it. But yeah. It's how likely is well, that? Okay. So, uh, so it's a it's a little bit more complex than that, but I appreciate that you're summarizing for your viewers um, uh, because there wasn't a direct contact as far as I know between the Iranians and the Americans, but they certainly telegraphed this highly choreographed uh, response, uh, not simply hours, but you know, um, I think probably several days in advance to the Turks and to others within the wider region. So the, the whole purpose of that was to make sure that the Israelis were fully prepared and that even if they lobbed uh, three or four hundred uh, projectiles uh, at the Israelis, that basically nothing would get through. And indeed, 99 percent didn't get through. Um, there was very little damage on Israeli territory. Um, so it, they completely absorbed that. Um, and you're right, they have said quite clearly that they now regard, quote unquote, the matter closed. Um, but of course, the Israelis won't look at it that way. Um, and the Israelis, um, and I speak here particularly about Netanyahu, as I said, he's got he's he's got his own factors that he's considering here. And I think that they're deeply political. Um, so we uh, uh, we wait to see how that's going to look. Thank you very, very much indeed, Dr. H.A. Heller, Senior Associate Fellow in International Security at the Royal United Services Institute and the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace.